Welcome to a new video in my home automation series and today we are looking at the Hover Group WLD2 which is a water leak detection device and you can set up this device in order to give you notifications when a water is detected and that notification can be an email notification it can be a text message notification also it supports SNMP networking protocol which is widely used in IT areas to monitor network equipment so that the same solution can be used to also monitor your water leakage and there is also a sense desk portal created so this device can connect to the sense desk portal where you can remotely monitor the device and also that sense desk portal is able to send you text messages and email alerts so you basically just set it up you set up your email list notifications or your phone numbers and your maintenance person would get an email immediately once water is detected and of course if you don't respond to that email and if there is still water detected let's say after 10 minutes or after, after half an hour you can configure the system to send you additional notification just to make sure that you're not forgetting about the fact that you know maybe your server room is being flooded there are many water leak detection or flood detection devices available on the market and they are all different in how they detect water leakage and uh, there are simpler methods which uh, simply rely on conductivity between different prones and there are more complicated methods which can measure water leak detection not only in a single point like a conductivity based water leak detection but let's say in an area or along a line and this product is uh, of this later type because as you can see here the detector itself or the sensor is a piece of wire so it could so this would be able to detect water leakage along this braided wire and this is actually quite important because there are a lot of scenarios where you know that you have potential leakage from a different area so you can surround that area using this water leak detector and it would be able to tell you if the water has leaked out of that area so let's say you have a server room and you have some ducts uh, some you know water pipes on one part of the building or in the corner and you can basically fence that corner or fence that area using this water leak detector so if any water leaks through that area or through basically this line it will definitely be detected and for this commercial and industrial application what is also really important is that the detection is reliable because in most cases these sensors are hidden out of sight again if i take the server room example that that would be you know under the force uh, flooring so if you have an alarm and you need to inspect that probably it's going to be a very labor intensive process so you definitely need a reliable system because as soon as you get false alarms those alarm system is just going to be turned off and basically it's going to be useless and also the other key requirement against this flows detection system is they should be able to detect water even in a small amounts because uh, if they trigger on a uh, larger amount or if they actually trigger some you know like a few centimeters of water which is already present at the area by the time you get the alarm it's probably going to be very late so all the things that I mentioned here is something what this water leak detector sensor can do or water or flood detection device because it has this braided wire which can detect the uh, flooding it would be able to detect it without any false alarm and it would even give you an alarm even if a small amount of water is present and it uses some sort of chemical process because in presence of the water the conductivity of this wire changes and that's what the device would be able to detect so it detects whether there is a presence of water so it's going to be a binary value so either water is detected or water is not detected and it wouldn't be able to tell you at what point within the wire the water is detected so it basically just give you a you know a true or a false alarm and you might be thinking that I'm talking too much about the detector and the sensor itself but actually this is the key of the whole system and without a reliable sensor which doesn't give you false alarm well the whole system doesn't really worth much but if I would like to continue with the sensor itself as you can see it made up of multiple segments so if I disconnect this connector here we can see that we do have this extension lead so this is a, like a two meter cable and uh, this uh, terminal connector end plugs into the actual device so that's the one which is going to do the detection 
and this wire itself is not going to detect water so this is just an extension lead to get the wires from between the device and to the actual detector and you have the detector cable which is this braided wire this one is also two meters and that also has an end and you can plug multiple of these cables together so if you need to detect uh, along the wall which is let's say four meters long you can buy an additional detector cable and you can just plug the two together and you always have to put this terminator plug at the end of the line. We talked about the actual detection quite a lot already so let me talk about the device. As you can see it comes in a metal box and on the front we have a couple of uh, power and network connection so you can power this device from the 5 volt supply and for this there is a 5 volt power supply which terminates in a barrel jack that's provided in the kit. In terms of the network connection there is an ethernet connection so you can wire it to your existing network but if you prefer it is also possible to set up a wi-fi connection so it will be able to connect via wi-fi and if your network has a power over ethernet functionality you can actually use the ethernet cable to power the device so then in that case you don't need the external power supply and on the other side we have four connection points so this single device can detect four different water detection loops and as i said each loop can have multiple of these two meter detectors but if you are using these detectors on multiple inputs uh, well actually you would be able to tell which you know line is detecting flooding so it could be more convenient to use multiple inputs rather than just one use one input and a really long cable and we also have a Wi-Fi antenna. As you can see, I set up the DLW. I use the external 5 volt power supply. So it is connected and I have a blue status LED on the Wi-Fi. Obviously I'm using it on the Wi-Fi. I haven't connected the ethernet cable. And on the back, I have connected the water sensor or the leak sensor to the first input. And second, third and fourth input are not connected at the moment. And I have the sensor here and I have a cup with some water in it so this is how we are going to test the water leak detection or the flood detection and here we can see the built-in administration page of this device so this web page is actually coming from this blue device so as soon as you connect it to the network it will receive a, an IP address and if you open your favorite browser and just to type in the IP address of the device which in my case is this one then you will be able to load this screen and here on the front page as you can see we have the general information of the device what's the name of the device what is the current date and time and the state of the four sensors so we have four inputs and they are just called water 501 502 503 504 and as you can see the first one is in normal state so not flooded and the second, third and the fourth are not connected. So it has actually detects that nothing is connected to it. If you connect the sensor and you get a disconnected status, then you maybe have forgotten to add the terminating resistor or the terminating piece at the end. So just make sure that the end of the cable is not open. So let's see what we can do with this device. And I think in the beginning we can look at how the detection works. So this is the cable and I think I'm just going to dunk the very end of it into the water. And obviously it's going to take a couple of seconds. Well, okay, well it's already detected that the cable is flooded. So this much water and well this short amount of time was enough for the system to detect the presence of water. And actually I'm just going to remove it as well. As I said, this detector cable is uh, like a braided wire. So that's pretty wet at the moment. So I think it would take a couple of minutes for this to dry out and for the device to say that it is no longer flooded. But maybe by the end of the video we will get to that state. But it is showing flooded at the moment. And pretty much the only thing I had to do to get to this state is give the unit a power uh, while well, also I had to configure the Wi-Fi. But if you would use cable internet, you just plug in your internet cable, you connect the extension cable to the green terminal here, and then you just plug the extension cable to the sensor, and also you plug the terminator at the end. Oh, by the way, at the end, you can see the red status LEDs. It is red for channel two, three, and four because there is nothing connected. And it's red for channel one because flooding is detected. But if it goes back to normal status, that LED will go off. 
Let me go through the general setup of this device and we are going to see how we can set up some alerting. So first of all, I go to the general setup and here you can, you know, rename the device and then set some general information about the, the device itself. Uh, renaming the device is actually important because as we are going to see later on in the notification emails, the device name gets included in the email as well. So if you have multiple of these devices, you can just name them like, you know, this is the server room, that's like storage room or something like that. You also can set some update intervals for this web page as well. And when you connect it using the network, you can specify what should be the IP address of the device. We are going to see the same screen on the Wi-Fi screen. So I'm going to talk more about that when we get there. And also by default, this web page is accessible by anyone. So as I said, you just uh, put in the IP address and this page will load. If you want a username and a password restriction to that page, you can set it here. So that was the general setup. Next, we can go to security. I'm going to glance over these uh, features. I'm not going to set them up, but at the moment, the connection between my computer and the WLD2 is unsecured connection, which I think it's absolutely fine for the local network that I'm testing it. But if you want to have secure communication between the devices, you can set up HTTPS certificates as well. So here you can import your certificate file, your key file, or if you don't have one generated for this device, you can actually generate your own self-site certificate on the device. So with this, you can switch from the unsecure HTTP to HTTPS connection. Next setup is the Wi-Fi setup. And here I've already done the connection or the setup to my home Wi-Fi network. And the easiest way I found to set up this device is, well, take a network cable, connect it to the network input, and then your device would automatically go onto the network. As I said, you find out what the IP address is. You come to this administration website and then you can configure the Wi-Fi. And once you have configured the Wi-Fi, you can just unplug the network cable and then, well, basically freely move the device around where, let's say, there is no cable access. And as you can see, it is already connected to my Wi-Fi. If I scroll a little bit down, this is why I've specified my Wi-Fi SSID and the password. And also here in the Wi-Fi setting, we have options to specify a fixed IP address. At the moment, I just left it on dynamic, which is, you know, for this review video is fine. But normally you will untick this and you will specify a dedicated IP address for this device. So it already gives you the options, you know, the gateway and the network mask based on your network settings. So you just have to uncheck this and then specify the IP address. And then from that point, this device would always receive this IP address from the router. And finally, in your Wi-Fi setup, you don't actually have to manually type in your Wi-Fi SSID. You can just click on this scan AP button and then it's going to scan for the Wi-Fi networks that are available in your area. And you just pick the one that you want to connect to, you specify the password and then it will connect to the Wi-Fi. The next page is a sensor page. And by the way, you can already see that the status is now back to normal. So the cable has dried out and it's no longer detecting water, uh, which is fine because I've removed it from the cup. So it only took about like, what was it? Probably two minutes for it to actually dry up and go back to the normal state. So here you have the four inputs and you can just again rename them. Just as I said previously, it's all going to be included in the alerts. So you might want to pick a name which is very descriptive to where actually the sensor is. So it would be easier for your team to locate where the flooding uh, alert is coming from. And then you can also set up an alarm target for each of the inputs individually. And you can just define a different alarm targets to it. I'm going to show you what it actually means, but basically these contains the email addresses or the phone numbers that need to receive the alert email or the alert text message. You can also set up a delay, which means that if you set it to zero, that immediately when flood is detected, it will trigger the alarm. If you set a, a delay, let's say, I don't know, for example, 60 seconds, and if it's still detecting flooding after one minute, then only it's going to send out the alarm. This could be useful if you want to eliminate or short duration alerts. We also have one option for virtual outputs, and these are settings that can be used to control other Havoc Group devices. So if water is detected, 
it can turn on another device which is let's say connected to a pump or something like that because i don't have such a device i'm not going to go through these settings later on but there are some really good documentation how you can set that up and that's also what you can configure in the outputs tab in the settings so you can specify these virtual outputs and then you can also test them and with this we reach to the part when we can configure the email and the text message alerts in this example i'm just going to only use email alerts and for this you need to have your email server which can send out emails so i don't have my own email server but i'm going to use gmail for that and you can see the gmail settings on uh, your screen now so you can set up what the, uh, the SMTP server is, the different ports, the authentication and the security, the username and the password. You also specify the from email address where the uh, email goes out from. And that's usually the same as the username or let's say in Gmail it's the same as the username and also subject. So subject is also something that is going to be in the email. So you probably can set it to flood alarm or something like that. And besides emails, you can also define text message gateways. So if you want to send out text messages, the text messages are going to be sent out using a remote gateway. So for example, your mobile phone provider will probably have a service like this where you can subscribe to and use that to send out text messages. And finally, we get to the part where we actually configure the alarms. And as I said, in the alarms, you can set up email addresses and phone numbers where you want to send, for example, emails or text messages. So here I created one email address. So that's where the email is going to be delivered to. I haven't configured any phone numbers because for that I don't have an SMS gateway configured at the moment. And you have the option to create multiple of these email alarms. And as we have seen on the sensor page, you can assign them to the different outputs. So you can send the emails to different uh, people depending on which detect or which sensor actually trigger the uh, flooding. And there is an option to send out a reminder as well. So let's say, for example, if I specify 60 here, that means if the flooding is detected and it is still being detected after 60 minutes, so after one hour, I can specify an email target where a notification email needs to be sent to so this could be like a manager email some sort of escalation email maybe to a different team that you can send a reminder email if the issue is not fixed in 60 minutes and with this set of configuration the email alerts uh, should be working now and as you can see i have already received two email alerts so there was one alert when the flooding started so as you can see the email subject contains the you know subject that we have configured on the settings page it contains the name of the device and it also contains the name of the detector input uh, so that's the first input where the flooding was detected and then it also shows that it's uh, you know it's at flooding status or flooded status at the moment and that's why the alarm started and after a couple of minutes after the sensor cooled then we have also received an alarm and so we are actually getting a confirmation that okay the issue is fixed and there is no more flooding detected and you can see that it took that much time between the two so if i look at the first email I can see that it contains everything about my device, you know, what is the IP, it only shows me all the four inputs and then it states that it was the first input where the alarm was triggered and well, that's pretty much what we need to know about the device. And on the second email, we get almost the same information. We can see that now the sensor value is zero, which is, you know, the normal status and the alarm ended because there is no more water detected on the first sensor. Moving on from the email and the text message alarms, it is also possible to set this device up in an SNMP monitoring solution. So if you have an IT system where you probably have an SNMP solution that is used to monitor your servers, your routers or network equipment, then this WLD2 can be also configured there. So it also supports the very same uh, protocol that is used by these network devices. And here you can specify just, you know, simple administrative tasks like what is the device name, location, you know, contact details, and then the SNMP access, uh, the public and the private community. And that's the access they have. So this is the default configuration, which I think you can leave it as it is. What is important from an network management point of view is the OID key tables. And these are the keys that you have to configure or add to the SNMP program. 
and also what you see here the actual values that the system provides or this device provides for these OE tables so you can even get the the name of the device you know firmware versions but I think what we are really interested in is the actual sensor values so you can see that the first sensor value is zero at the moment so it is zero when it is in normal status it is 20 when it is disconnected and it's actually 10 when flooding is detected so if you configure it in an SNMP solution you can set an alarm on this when it gets set to one and since we are talking about SNMP I just also want to mention that if you navigate to the system tab you have access to the MIB table as well which is another administration settings for in SNMP for devices you have the OID as well and the MIBs as well here and I also want to cover the last two tabs on this administration portal the first of all is the time so this is where you configure how the device would know the exact date and the time so it connects to time servers and to be able to update its internal clock you'll obviously specify what is the summertime period and and the sync period and of course your time zone or if you don't want to use NTP servers you can also specify the date and the time here manually the last step in here is the portal and this is the sense desk portal integration and I would like to cover the sense desk portal in a separate video otherwise it's going to be too big but that's where you can configure the administration for the sense desk portal integration so you can enable or disable the portal integration here you can also set up some teams and a team passwords and of course the values would get automatically pushed from this device up to the portal so by enabling the integration you can manage this device over the portal altogether and you also have a logging option here where you can monitor whether the connection to the sense desk portal is working properly and the last step is the system tab where you can also uh, download some configuration I've already mentioned about the OID and the MIP tables if you need to you can also download the setup of this uh, device in an XML format the actual values in an XML format actually these values.xml could be used to integrate this device with other third-party applications and also you have the usual functions here for example check for the firmware version making sure that the system is running on the latest firmware and if there is any newer firmware you can start a network upgrade or you can upload a firmware file manually as well and actually it looks like that I'm on 1.3.10 and there is a 1.3.11 so I can initiate a network update and it would just download the latest version of the application software and then it would just reboot into the new version I think that would be my review of the Hover Group WLD2 water leak detection or flood detection device if you are interested in this product I'm going to leave purchasing links in the video description but that will be all for today thanks for watching and hopefully see you in the next video.